above water. So also it was exposed in 2022, but it wasn't again. I'm clicking buttons, believe it or not. <laughs> there we go. Uh, in 1968 was the previous time it had been exposed. And you can see kind of roughly these patterns where the water is basically lapping up against the shoreline, 67 again, and here in, in 1965 when they were filling the dam. So that site from this point to this point was submerged for 54 years. So we just happened to stop at the right place at the right time, and Donnie put the toilet in the perfect location. <laughs> and anyway, uh, awesome. So uh, you probably noticed that <laughs> circular depression on the top. The first process, we cleaned all the debris away in front and picked up all the pieces that contained bone and recorded them and packed them and jacketed them. Um, and then we started beating on this, uh, that upper ledge, which we thought had nothing in it. Um, big, thick sandstone. I took a round of bashing on it with an eight pound sledge. Then Adam took a turn, and then I took a turn, and all of a sudden this piece just popped off, landed upside down, and there was an articulated skeleton laying there. Mm. This is the back of the skull. This is the big opening at the back of the head. This is a zygomatic arch. Here you can see the eye sockets, the front of the skull right here. Here's the skull inside view. Here's the backbone coming down here with the ribs on each side, mm. and this is a forelimb. This is the counterpart. The rest of it's still buried in the rock. So the next uh, next step, the next step, <laughs> there, okay, oh right, here, here we go. So there's that ledge a little closer, uh, right here. You can see that funny looking depression right there. Now, these depressions are all over this, this carbonate surface, which is super cool. This is where the skeletons were found, and then this is all the original stuff we found in all these beds underneath that we we're trying to get to. And, uh, just packed with material from here all the way up to here. So just loaded with bone. Um, there's Mike Callahan, who gave us a lot of help driving us around in the boat, um, getting us uh, our gear there. I'll mention other people too as we go. Uh, but you can see we then flipped that big block that had the skeleton in it. And there's another skeleton here. It's really hard to see. The backbone goes along here, and you can see faint traces of ribs. There's possibly a skull in this area, and there may be another individual tucked along the side. Unfortunately, like I said, this stuff's been underwater for so long, it, a lot of the bone is rotted away, and the bone is actually slightly softer than the actual matrix. So that also caused a little bit of issue when it came to CT scanning the blocks as well. This is the little tail uh, section right here, articulated tail section, is right in front of Hunter over here. Um, so, yeah, we found lots of cool stuff. Anyway, we pulled this back, lifted this off. There you can see that tritelodon jacket. We then took the rock saw to it and trimmed the block down for good reason. We don't want to carry all that stuff out. Uh, and then we also did some little peels of a lot of the really cool bones that were underneath it. So we found another three or four jaws on this surface after we peeled this, this big block away. Um, all right, so the crew. He's not looking at you, but you'll see his face soon. Um, Adam Marsh, he's the paleontologist at uh, Petrified Forest National Park. He's also a guy that just recently redescribed the dinosaur Dilophosaurus, which is a famous one you all know from Jurassic Park. So Adam is a, a specialist not only in late Jurassic, but also early Jurassic rocks, especially the Glen Canyon group, like myself. Uh, Hunter Carter, he's our prep lab manager. Uh, there you are. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it, it was his first trip coming out with us in the field. Amazing job. And Jalisa, right there, I think she's heckling me from the back. Anyway, happy birthday, Jalisa. <laughs> um, anyway, then we started, uh, you can see, so we have to put these protect, protective jackets. With, we put, first, we put a layer of toilet paper to protect the bone uh, and all the surrounding rock that we want to keep multiple layers, and then we start applying plaster, uh, a burlap dipped in plaster, and we wrap bandages. We had to put around three, three coats over this thing, and you can see here we then had to trench underneath and tuck the jackets underneath, sometimes having to prop chisels up to hold the, 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 uh, the bandages in place. So 
a lot of hard work. Then we flip the block. Guess what? More jaws. Here's another jaw right here. The front incisor, teeth. Here's two jaws. This one's in really bad shape, but this one's pretty good. There's the back of the jaw there, teeth here, incisor up the front. They're kind of like this, kind of facing each other. And then there's the closed up jacket at the end. Oops. All right, so lateral to this bone site, on the same bedding surfaces, we found footprints. And look at these footprints. You can see one, two, three, four, five toes. And here you can see a couple of toes from the front foot, just like you see here. One, two, three, four, five, and then a front foot in front. And then this one's just covered in them. So these are large, pretty large. They're, you know, a good inch and a half in diameter, maybe a little bigger, maybe two inches. Um, and these are possible footprints now in close association with these bone beds. Um, this has never been recorded before. Uh, anyway, there are sites that are known that are older where they actually have burrows uh, with skeletons and they found trackways associated with the burrows. So maybe this is another possible scenario we have here. We just need to get out there and do more work. Also at the same site, we find these small three-toed footprints which are produced by small meat-eating dinosaurs. Um, the next step, I'll show you pictures of those guys soon. So our last day, quarry's done. We're getting ready to leave. Last step is measuring the, the uh, stratigraphy. And here you can see Adam is using a Jacob staff with a Brenton. As we detail, go through and measure bed by bed, look at the lithology, so look at the grain sizes, what, what it's made up of, and how much mud content compared to sand, etc. We look at invertebrate burrows and things like that. Then all of a sudden, Adam's like way around the corner and I hear, I got bone. <laughs> so we go running over there and sure enough, Adam found bone in this ledge, and which is lower. So it's an older bone bed than the one we found previously. This large block, you can see all these dark pieces. This is a piece of the jaw right here. Anyway, this is not terribly impressive to look at, but there's stuff inside the rock that we can still prepare out. And then Hunter walked nearby and he found this beautiful lower jaw. Here you can see the back of the jaw, the teeth in place, and the big incisor out front. And I have that specimen here so you can take a look at it. And of course, there's the site. And guess who camped there? <laughs> I want to bring Donnie with us wherever we go from now on on Lake Powell, especially if we're looking for phone sites. The guy's like the lucky, lucky charm. Amazing. Um, All right, there's our strat section. And if we gave it a name. We now call it Tritelodon Cove, kind of a cool name. So what we see, we can see typical Cantifaces. Occasionally we get dunes mixed in, but Adam and Hunter's site is actually in river channel deposits uh, that are more Cantifaces-like. The site that I found is in more dune-like deposits. So you can see these are, these are carbonates right here, and you've got dunes above and below. This is more of a lake, a pond-type deposit right here. So this is the Navajo site that I found. Even though it's lower elevation, it's definitely higher in the section because of the way all the cliffs are, are dipping. So our section was about 18 meters thick, so not particularly thick. But uh, what was amazing as we were driving, aw uh, driving away in the boat from the, from the area, Adam and I, we were all freaking out. We just, we could not believe how similar for miles and miles these species were. Now, Mark Lockley's covered tons of that area, and he's found tracks everywhere, but he's never had an eye for bone. And I have a feeling well, there's going to be more bone sites. I, I'm, we're almost certain of it. So we're super excited to get back. All right, so the upper bone site, again, the data. Uh, May 20, I could look at these a little bit closer, maybe I didn't try that for the other one, but I actually got it to the day uh, when it was uh, 3,350 feet. So, and then August 2021, it was exposed. And then for a tiny bit in 68 and 69, and then you can see, so a lot of this stuff is probably waves lapping up against the shore, up against the, uh, the sites, so they're getting impacted by wave action, especially with all the boats on the lake. Um, in 1966, it was getting hit 
Anyway, so in comes this guy. As soon as I found 